Great. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker to you. And Professor Gisli Nilsson comes to us from the University of Iceland. Um, Gisli is a professor of anthropology, and he has been fascinated by two particular aspects of genealogy in Iceland. The first is the Book of Icelanders, which uh, was an amazing online tool that connected all the various pedigrees of Iceland, many of which go back to about 900 AD. And uh, the second uh, aspect of uh, genealogy in Iceland that has really captured the imagination of, of a lot of people is Decode Me, and the fact that they actually tested um, virtually the entire population of Ireland, of Iceland, certainly a very, very good um, proportion of it. And today, uh, Gisli is going to talk to us about um, Hans Jonathan, about reconstructing the uh, genome of a Caribbean runaway slave, and as well as that, uh, the Book of Icelanders, Decode Me, and the parallels between Iceland and Ireland and the way that we approach genealogy. So, this is going to be a fascinating lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a big warm welcome to Gisli Palsen. Thank you very much. I'm here to, I'm, I'm pleased to be invited to speak about uh, my issues. Uh, the uh, project that I'm, I'm talking about is part of uh, a larger project uh, under the umbrella of Citigen, which is funded by, uh, by the European Research uh, Horizon 2020. And there are several of us here who, who participate in this Citigen project, Identity, Citizenship, and Nationhood in the Post-Genome Era. So, this is my theme. I'm basically talking about Iceland uh, in one way or another. Iceland is, uh, is a small country uh, and uh, an island, and islands can be useful to think with. Uh, the Republic of Ireland has 14 times the population of Iceland, I think. And the smaller you, you have the scale, the, the more easy it is maybe to flesh out some issues. And I'm speaking about genealogies, DNA, and, and personal names a bit. So these are the themes. Uh, naming practices, uh, surnames, and Acronyms and other forms of naming. Uh, the visualization of, of genealogies and personal genomics, you know more about that than I do. Uh, digital genealogies, uh, the Book of Icelanders, and the issue of blackness in, in the north, in Scandinavia, in Iceland. And at the end, I will show a brief uh, trailer on a, from a documentary about. Uh, a guy named Hans Jonathan, who was a Caribbean slave who settled in Iceland in, in 1802. So here's the geographical context. Iceland uh, was settled by Norse and uh, people from the British and Scottish Isles and, and Ireland. And DNA research uh, shows that the male DNA is typically from Western Norway, while the mitochondria, the female contribution, is typically or heavily from, from Ireland and the British Isles. Uh, the Norse went uh, westward in the 9th or 10th century uh, to Iceland and, and on to Greenland. And uh, down south to Lamso Metal at least and, and there was some speculation early last century that the Norse had uh, mixed with the Inuit and uh, so the, the Icelandic genome could be pretty wide if there's any evidence to this. Um, I organized a project uh, with a biological anthropologist to study the Inuit genome, although I'm speaking about Iceland, I'm, I'm squeezing in Inuit because it's interesting in several ways. And this is a, a small 
community Cambridge Bay in Nunavut in Canada with only 1,500 inhabitants. And it's somewhere here, part of a Canadian state. And uh, in order to be able to do our uh, biological genetic study, we had to uh, negotiate with elders in the Inuit community because they are the informal power and we had to present what we wanted to do and, and again the results afterwards and, and this was quite interesting of course we respected the protocols the ethics of research but here is my colleague Agna Delkason uh, who works both Article genetics in Reykjavik and in my department in anthropology. And he's presenting the results to uh, the representatives of the elders in this tiny community. And it was interesting for many reasons. Uh, for one thing, the Inuit were pleased that there was not a tinge of evidence to the statement that there was a Norse mixture. They were pure Inuit, had nothing to do with Scandinavia. And uh, secondly, it was interesting how difficult it was to explain DNA and genetics to these people who had no, uh, no, uh, uh, probably no form of schooling after the age of, of 10, 12. And here's my colleague trying to explain to them. But uh, it was an interesting uh, communication, and uh, we learned the anthropologists that the Inuit thought of relationship very differently from from the Western or Euro-American science point of view. For the Inuit naming is the avenue into relationship because because when children are born they receive a name from from their parents and, and kin and neighbors and friends. And these sets of names that the individual requires form in the end with understanding the personality of, of, the, of the child and, and the life course. So it's an interesting contrast. It reminds us we, we shouldn't take, uh, uh, take it for a fact that relationship and kinship is totally based on, on DNA. For these people, kin and relationships is, is very different. Also, we, we might take a look into history. This is a medieval representation of, of kinship, of a family, and uh, it's beautiful painting from the 15th or 16th century. Shows uh, a lineage, uh, no, the roots of the tree are in the soil, and then the uh, branches spread out with different ancestors. And the tree is a quite common metaphor. We see it on in the hallway. Family is tree. But we don't necessarily have to look at relationships or kinship in, in terms of tree. There are other metaphors historically and, and also from anthropology we know that for a fact. And interestingly, in the Middle Ages there was a raging theological debate about trees like that because some of the theological experts thought it was degrading to have the roots in the messy, murky soil. And also they inverted the tree to make the roots closer to the heavens and the gods. This is a modern construction of a genealogical tree. It's an asthma tree for an Icelandic family, for an Icelandic uh, village. Here is the founder. And, and then the generations fan out. And the dark spots are the uh, persons with uh, asthma, diagnosed with asthma, and what he told us is a look for the genetic signatures of, of asthma. But the image itself is, is appealing, and it happens to have been a kind of informal local for people genetics. Lots of Icelanders wear t shirts with this image on. Now, personal genomics, here was the launching of the project 23andMe in New York City in 2008, I think. You know a lot about this project, and I won't dwell on it. But the, I, this was called the Speed Party in, in the New York Times. And so it made me reflect on speaking image and stuff like that from years ago. 
Pico Genetics in Reykjavik uh, uh, had a similar project called Pico Me, and in fact it was the first project of the kind. It's not in operation any long anymore, but uh, it was uh, quite an interesting project. And of course I signed that as an anthropologist, and, and I was promised two things. And, um, information about, uh, I don't know, 40 or 50 conditions and diseases, um, the probability of getting asthma, for instance, and also an opportunity to look into my ancestry and, and the death of my family tree. And uh, this was quite interesting in several ways. This was uh, 10 years ago. And for instance, I have no alcohol plus reaction. Uh, and a chance of Alzheimer uh, less than the average. Uh, and of course this is based on, on reference populations and available medical studies at the time. And then there's ancestry. Uh, my, my ancestry is first and foremost European, but interestingly Secondly, Southwest Asian, and no one has been able to explain this to me, not even the experts who created this database. So it's still a mystery in the family. And uh, this is the European aspect. Uh, the second uh, connection, strongest connection, given the reference populations, is the Orcadians, uh, Orkneys, Ireland. Not surprising. Um, uh, the second within Europe, etc. And this is my Southwest Asian past, or whatever it is. Um, I don't think it means very much. Means very much. The, I would like to say more about the so-called book of Icelanders. Uh, Icelanders have been genealogical enthusiasts from the settlement in the 9th century. And there is a rich literature on families and and uh, we have lots of experts in, in genealogies, like you have here. But in uh, 2003, Deco Genetics uh, lined up with a software company, Chris Software, to digitalize all genealogical records in Iceland from the beginning. And it's taken years and dozens of people to track down the archives and to add new members to the to the database, and I followed the launching because I found this an interesting uh, experiment. It's the first of its kind, a digitalization of genealogies for an entire country. And uh, the, uh, when they opened in 2003, the uh, reception was phenomenal. 18,000 uh, people subscribed or opened in, in a few days. Then it's slacked off, and but remained fairly constant for months. And still, it's a it's a constant uh, traffic through the system. And most Icelanders have uh, subscribed. If you have an Icelandic social security number, you're entitled to join, and it's free. And so, practically everyone can and, and join, and, and most Icelanders do. And it's interesting to follow. The launching and, and Decode offered uh, people a chance to uh, comment on, it was not just information on trees, but also something on your personal life, and family, spouses, and stuff. And uh, it was interesting to follow this process of communicating with the public, and uh, Decode uh, graciously offered me an opportunity to, uh, to read some of the uh, responses from the public, and I'll show you a few. Boss, this is really exciting. I got thinking of this when I was having my hair dyed at the hairdresser. On both sides were women saying, listen, my son-in-law turns out to be your husband's cousin, etc. Certainly all cocktail parties had been turned into family reunions. I don't know this woman, and in any case, I'm not married to her. But if this indeed were the case, by all means, don't tell anyone about it. <laughs> my husband was listed as my partner. When I clicked on him, the name of his former girlfriend 
change COVID phase are theory. Today we are married, and the only thing that my husband and his former girlfriend have in common is a dog that was executed in 1998. <laughs> so I don't see any point in listing this woman here. I registered for the Book of Icelanders. According to the records, I have no parents. Am I at home? <laughs> it would be fun to know what went wrong. So I explored my ancestry and, and my, my background. Uh, I was aware of uh, a few generations, but this opened a uh, whole new avenue. And I can trace my, my origins back to the 1400s and possibly further back if I go into the archives. And it's an amazing tool. And uh, here's my mother and her lineage, and here's my father. And you see, this is my grandmother. She disappears into loneliness, and it's because she was fair ways, and she's, her, her background is not in, in the database. But uh, I can also check through the book of Icelanders with any Icelander who's ever been around. And it's amazing. Uh, lots of Icelanders use that tool to explore. Before going to meetings, for instance, people log in and check uh, how is this person across the table related to me. And you will get in a split second exactly. Usually it's a seventh or eighth generation because this is a small, small population. And there have been bottlenecks in history because of the eruptions and plagues. So most people descend from the same ancestors. Anyway, this is a kind of site issue. Uh, the uh, Book of Icelander, Icelanders and, and the tools I've talked about so far allow you to uh, explore your connection with, with uh, Scandinavians, typically. I mean, Icelanders who have roots in Iceland. But what about people who come from abroad? What about blacks? This used to be a thoroughly white population. Um, here's the cover of a new biography of the first black person who settled in Iceland in 1802, Hans Jonathan. He uh, uh, was born in uh, from St. Croix in the Danish West Indies, and his mother was from Ghana or presumably around in West Africa. Uh, and uh, at the age of seven, the boy was he was uh, a slave, like his cow slave, his, his, his mother, and he was sent to, get to Copenhagen with his owners, the Schimmelmann family, who owned thousands of slaves and plantations. And uh, he, the boy escaped. He was rebellious and uh, clever and spoke seven languages apparently. And he escaped from Copenhagen to Iceland uh, because he was not satisfied with the legal verdict in a famous court case that sentenced him to remain a slave. This is a plantation on uh, St. Croix where he was born. We have the records of baptism and, and we also have the dozens of pages from the famous court case in Copenhagen, which is part of the uh, important material that I was able to draw upon. And this is a place where Hans Jonathan settled in 1802. He arrived through the Danish trading store there in eastern Iceland and uh, the building where he worked, part of it stands here under a beautiful mountain and uh, here he spent the rest of his life. He married an Icelandic woman uh, in the neighborhood and they had two kids and their descendants are now 1,000 or so. Mostly in Iceland, but uh, quite a few abroad as well. So this is uh, his one of his grandson, uh, Björn Eriksson, and he is said to have been the spitting image of the old man. But the old man died before the birth of uh, 
photography and there's no drawing, only a few handwritten documents by him. So he was he looked like this one in phenotype. Now here I'm checking through the book of Icelanders I told you about earlier. I can check my relationship to the descendants of Hans Jonathan by asking the, the machine to tell me how I relate to Catherine Antonio Stokic, who was the wife of Hans Jonathan, born in 1798. And this is the result. I'm here, and uh, here's the, the guy, Bjorn Eriksson, whose picture you saw, and his grandmother. So uh, this is uh, a typical Icelandic connection. We all related to the same employee. Uh, Oops. Yeah, here we have the descendant, the local inhabitants of Tupavo, the place I showed you, uh, for a kind of uh, festival in the beginning of a new, new century, a new house. In 1900, and uh, no doubt some of Hans Jonathan's descendants are there. The interesting thing is that Hans Jonathan didn't experience any racism as far as we know. He is uh, remembered as, a, as an honorable traitor and, and playing fair and, and respected for preaching uh, against alcohol and, and teaching people uh, navigation and stuff like that. Uh, so, Icelanders, the local inhabitants, probably saw him as somewhat different from themselves, but maybe just like uh, a farmer from the next community. Uh, things changed in, in the early 20th century because of the uh, growing independence movement, which emphasized the purity of the Icelandic population. Uh, which emphasized the uh, origin of Icelanders, the Viking heritage, and uh, the fact that uh, 13th, 12th, 13th century Icelanders have, cre have created world heritage, namely the sagas. And uh, how could we uh, possibly uh, flag the black blood that came in maybe in the 19th century? Uh, and some of the descendants of Hans Jonathan say they would be quiet about their origin because black was not supposed to be around. And here's the family tree, Hans Jonathan and Katrin. And these are the African roots, African European, which we don't know much about. There's a debate about the paternity of the guy, and, but I elaborate on that in the book. And here are his descendants. And, uh, way on uh, a thousand people. Um, here is a woman, uh, Roberta Eriksson Tolles, who came to Iceland in 1985 with her father. They had heard that they had an ancestor who lived in eastern Iceland and they came to explore their roots. And uh, they didn't learn much during the visit to the uh, community because few people spoke English at the time. But they went to the archives in Reykjavik and discovered that the ancestor Hans Jonathan was a black guy called a mulatto, mixed white and black, and that he had been a slave, the son of a house slave descending from West Africa. So it, it was quite a, a discovery for, for this lady. And she happened to be teaching Afro-American history in Boston. And she was stunned to, to learn that there was an African uh, Caribbean uh, element in her genome. Uh, now, this is the story of uh, the mapping of Hans Jonathan's genome. I won't say much about it, but uh, in a few weeks, uh, one of the major journals in, in modern genetics have published a major uh, paper on the reconstruction of the genome of Hans Jonathan. And it's groundbreaking in several respects. For one thing, uh, in this case, you don't have 
any biological sample to draw upon directly from House Jonathan. We know roughly where his graveyard is, but we don't know the grave site, or, and there are no bones or nothing. But uh, dozens of his uh, uh, descendants in Iceland are in the database, the genetic database of ecogenetics, and, and the, uh, the uh, black uh, signature stands out in the, in the records because there was no, practically no uh, black immigration before Hans Jonathan. So by pulling the uh, analysis of the genome of these descendants, they're able literally to reconstruct part of Hans Jonathan's genome. Um, so that's kind of fun. And secondly, this project is aiming to uh, establish roughly uh, where in Africa his uh, Jonathan's mother came from. Uh, the historical records would, would tell us roughly, I mean, uh, the Danish trade vessels sailed from the Gold Coast in Africa, but uh, the slaves would arrive to the coast from different parts of, of Africa, Western Africa. So uh, ideally this project would uh, establish uh, better than the uh, historical records where Hans Jonathan's mother came from and her ancestors. Uh, I can't tell you more about the paper and its results. I can only say that I think it will be groundbreaking and exciting and to, to see how, how genetics and genealogy and, and uh, archival work and my case can fill in the picture. Interestingly, one of Hans Jonathan's descendants, Inter Peterson, who is one of the directors of Nintendo in, in Seattle in the United States, decided to sign up for 23andMe. He was born and, and raised in Iceland, but he lives in Seattle, and both of his parents are Icelandic, so he was exploring his own roots. He knew about the African roots, so 0.7% of this uh, genome are sub Saharan. And here are the reference populations. Uh, I think he had this done uh, a couple of years ago. And another, this is 23 and me. It's a bit blurred, but uh, you know how this works. And it's interesting to see an Icelander do this test to explore the black heritage. So I won't say much more here. I hope I haven't taken too much of your time. And and now we have a few minutes uh, on a new documentary <coughs> trailer uh, about the life of Hans Jonathan and, and the visit of some of the descendants to uh, uh, St. Croix in the famous now American West Indies. Let's see how it goes. Can you play with the lights? Alex Fred Larson, 
so to speak, discovered Hell's Yard. Because in his film, Slave of the Slime, he gave the story extensive coverage. Alex Feinborn first heard of Hans Jonathan when he was in San Croix. We were there like, or the name of the team was there. But it's not like there was some other, some other cross out. So it's all right. So you'll get that to stay for some other. But even if you don't answer, there will be no other ones. Let them know us in the next slide or some time. You stay here. You know something. Whatever you stand. The descendants of Hans Jonathan are about 1,000, spread throughout the world, although most of them are There's no indication that Hans Jonathan was not well received by the locals when he arrived. He was a Danish merchant, blessed with many outstanding talents. But his background, the color of his skin, didn't seem to matter to people. Social currents reached us that stoked the fires of racism. These narrow-minded attitudes would affect the descendants of Hans Jonathan in one way or another. Today, there is a growing awareness among certain ethnic groups that were the victims of slavery. And there are calls for reconciliation. The inhabitants of San Francisco represent one of these groups. For about the last 10 years, the U.S. Virgin Islands and Denmark have been engaged in a series of conversations and dialogues regarding reconciliation. Uh, the history which binds our two countries and our two peoples is that of colonization and slavery. And there are 250 years of continuous Danish history on the issue is now the former Danish West Indies, the now U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, much of that history is steeped in brutality and inhumanity, you can imagine. And in the years now leading up to the centennial of the sale of these islands from Denmark to the United States of America, uh, leading up to 2017, uh, we are looking at the many ways which our people can pursue reconciliation and put this uh, awful and dreadful past behind us. As a young man, Hans Jonathan decided to chase for him. In effect, to steal himself and flee the enslavement his mother's race had to endure. Excellent. Um, ladies and gentlemen, give me a now we have uh, time for uh, some questions, and um, I'm just going to put up the last slide that we had there. And in fact, um, oh, that was the yes. Yeah, so let's go to these slides here, and I'd like to go back to the one that you have about the book, which is uh, um, I'm reading it at the moment. It's a very well written book. Um, very interesting reads, and I certainly recommend it to anybody. The man who stole himself, um, and it's it's going to be of, of incredible significance to us in the gene genealogy community. The thing, <coughs> the work that you're doing is um, sorry, groundbreaking. I'm going to stand a bit over here just in case it's interfering with that microphone. But um, questions for Gizzy. Let me clear. Curious about any wine DNA testing done to find the origin of the father of the uh, Saint Croix mother from Ghana. Yep. Thank you. It's a it's a good question, and I've been puzzled by the by the question of of, of the father. And the uh, records say Emilia Regina, his mother, was uh, born on a plantation. Constitution Hill, the property of Heinrich Schimmelmann. Uh, the father is not reported, but rumor has it that it was the secretary 
So this is the records. And, uh, people have been puzzled for years what it means. But uh, I'm uh, collaborating with people at the code on, on genetic testing uh, in order to try to, uh, to say something meaningful about maternity history. I discussed three hypotheses in the book. Uh, two have been kind of rumors for decades, but I offer my third hypothesis on the basis of the only written evidence we have, namely the, the baptism record. And I managed to get three DNA samples in, in Copenhagen, from uh, two from one, one of the candidates and, and one from the second. And I was negotiating uh, having a sample from uh, one of the Simmermans, which is, uh, the, I think, the second most likely candidate. And uh, after some discussions, they <coughs> refused to collaborate, uh, which was very sad. But uh, it's, it's partly because the Simmerman family has been enmeshed in debates on slavery. They have thousands of slaves. And, and uh, they're well aware of the fact that uh, people are now requesting uh, some kind of uh, uh, reimbursements, or what you would call it, uh, some payments or support, as the representative Shelley Mohat uh, indicated in the film. So, sadly, the uh, Shemelmans collectively decided to back out at the last minute. Uh, Having samples from the families, apparently from the fa families of the three candidates, would have been wonderful. But there may be an opportunity later on, I hope. Thank you. And, uh, Kisen, the, um, what do you think are the implications of the work that you're doing for the, for the, for the whole discussion of reparation? I think. Uh, a biography of uh, an enslaved person from uh, the Danish colonies uh, is important from the current debates about uh, uh, compensations and, and, uh, and uh, responsibility. And I think the Danish Queen is going to St. Croix next month and lots of people are waiting to hear what she will say. No Danish leader has formally offered an apology for one of the major slave trades in history. One of the, one of the, This is music. So, yeah, no Danish leader has offered an apology up to now, despite heavy pressures. And uh, I'd be glad to see what the Queen has to say. I respect the lady, and she has her integrity, and I would be surprised if she doesn't use the opportunity to finally apologize for the ugliness of Danish slavery. Sorry about the problem with the microphone. I think there's interference with the different uh, sound systems in the uh, in the hall. Um, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure the, the work that you're doing is going to open up a whole new discussion about reparations and slavery, and uh, will bring a whole new perspective to this discussion. Now, uh, any other questions? We have a few here. I'm going to uh, bring this down to Roberta, and then I'm going to bring it back to you, Gizli. Will the DNA results of uh, uh, Hans or his descendants be in any of the public databases like the, what, the Family Tree DNA, Y-DNA, or the civil database for comparison? I really don't know how these things work, but... Uh, I imagine uh, if people like this uh, Icelander, uh, Inka, 
subscribe to these services and, and record their uh, ancestors. I imagine uh, this will somehow be in the global uh, records uh, in the long run. Uh, and that's one of the interesting things with Alternity is the fact that these databases are linked together and we can explore our routes back and forth. Um, but uh, I don't have a good sense of how... I followed these things uh, 12 years ago when 23andMe and Depot started, but I don't really have a good sense of how things are going now in terms of sharing and reporting. Okay, other questions? Debbie? of things. I think the important point is that uh, slave uh, racism in the Danish uh, empire only arrived with uh, the plantations. So it's uh, the slave trade and, and the uh, plantations, slavery, this was the uh, birthplace of slavery in, in, in Denmark. And and the same with the UK, I guess. I mean, historians have established this. Racism in, in the form we know today didn't exist in Europe before the slave trade. But, uh, of course, there were ideas about people with different color or head shapes or whatever prior to this, uh, even in ancient Greece. And, uh, but it was not the racism that we know now, and skin color, etc. But uh, you're right, the eugenic movement in the early 20th century had uh, a lot of impact in Iceland as well. There was a strong movement and uh, a Nazi party just before the war, etc. And lots of Icelandic intellectuals subscribed to, to the uh, racism that uh, uh, German physical anthropologists had advocated uh, in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, but uh, the rhetoric on, on race uh, in Denmark with uh, slavery seems to have, arri have arrived relatively late to Iceland. So when Hans Jonathan came in 1802, Icelanders had not been uh, subjected to this kind of thinking. But over the next uh, decades, the things will change. And now again, it's radically different. And Icelanders uh, <coughs> debate about immigration and color and the rest of it, like the rest of Europe. They also celebrate diversity and, and, and color. Um, I'm just thinking about the statistics of how we're going to reconstruct this genome. I'm, I'm sure you can't say too much about it. But if his father was white, come on. Sorry. If his father was a uh, Shimmerman, who was a white Danish chap, will he have, will the Shimmermans have lots of descendants in Iceland and you'll be able to reconstruct the European part of Hans Jonathan's genome? Whereas if he just had two sons and then they passed on his DNA, you're not going to get 100% of his African DNA, you're going to get uh, maybe up to 75% of it, I'm not sure. I don't know if you can say anything about that. I guess the establishing who the father was is interesting on its own for the sort of history and for the descendants. Finally, this is our man. But uh, I, I really can't comment upon the on the details of the calculations, it's not my field, and in any case it's too technical for me, and, and even, even though I have the figures, I, I wouldn't be able to make sense of them. Any other questions for, for Gisli? Okay. Thank you. We'll call them then. Thank you, Gisli Palsen.